name is Amanda Kiefer, um, the Communication Associate at the Cardinal Institute for West Virginia Policy. And today we have with us Coach Chad Greer from Oceanside Collegiate Academy in South Carolina. Thanks for joining us today. Thanks for having me. Appreciate it. Well, we just wanted to um, speak with you today because we wanted to get a feel for uh, charter school athletics. So in West Virginia, we've been discussing charter schools really since the beginning of the year, back in January. Now we're in an education special session and we're focusing just on education and not other kinds of legislation. And one of the things that came up in this discussion of charter schools and bringing them to West Virginia was, well, what are the athletics like? Do they get to compete? Um, do they steal students from public schools? Like all those kinds of questions came up. So we wanted to pick your brain a little bit since you have experience. Um, but let's start at the beginning. And why don't you just tell us a little bit about yourself and your career? Oh, um, well, uh, I'm a dad. I've got four boys. My oldest is a uh, former West Virginia um, quarterback and student, uh, Will. And then uh, my youngest is eight weeks old. And I've got one of 21 and 19 in between. So um, uh, married to Nyla. We've been together about 15 years. Coach and athletic director at Oceanside, which is a charter school here in Mount Pleasant, South Carolina, um, going on my third year here. Um, my mom was a career educator, um, and um, I, I've got a master's degree, so I've, I've spent a lot of time in, in school myself. So uh, not an expert, but certainly I uh, have varied experiences. I've coached in uh, private schools, public schools, and now a charter. So I feel like I've got a, a pretty decent background, at least. A little bit of everything. Yeah. <laughs> so um, why did you decide to coach at a charter school? Um, now, and I don't want to sound uh, too, um, I mean, the truthful answer is uh, I just prayed about it daily. He liked the path that he wanted me to, to be on. And this is where, yeah. he so it's really nothing more than that. It was, um, there was nothing about this opportunity that jumped out and went, Hey, you need to go to Oceanside. It was uh, quite the opposite, really. It was, um, I had a lot of people going, man, what are you doing? Why in the world would you go there? And it's turned out to be a tremendous blessing in many, many ways, many times over. Would you say it's kind of been a ministry opportunity for you then? I think coaching in general is a ministry opportunity. If you, if you do it right, um, you've got access to young people that are, um, and whether they know it or not, they're in need of, of positive influence. And, and I certainly think the game of football is unique and that uh, what it takes to um, prepare to play, be successful, and what it takes in terms of um, the uh, very few opportunities to actually compete. So the, the learning, um, I think our society is very instant gratification oriented. And I think in football, you've got to work basically year round for 10 opportunities to go out and play under the lights and earn any more than that. So uh, I love the game and, and the opportunity to use it to teach. And then, um, yeah, I mean, I think, and certainly to me in my own way, this is my ministry. It's what I feel like I'm called to do. And uh, hopefully I can impact young people in a positive way as a result. Well, that's wonderful. It's, a, it's good to find a career where you can have a good impact. No um, what would you say makes your charter school or I guess Oceanside's charter school athletics program unique? I think the mission uh, of the school itself, the actual charter, is unique. Um, I came from an area where there were uh, very successful charter schools that I was very familiar with, um, but they each you know, have their own you know, unique angle. I think that's kind of what charter schools are by definition. It's community-oriented, uh, parent uh, involvement. They create a local board that says, here's how we want to educate our, our children differently. Um, this charter uh, school, the charter is, is really is two things, lead academics and lead athletics. And so the focus is, is very real. It's very narrow. Um, but having a focus on athletics is unique for a charter school. And um, as a result, uh, we have teachers who teach, coaches who coach. Our school days split. Uh, they only teach honors classes and dual enrollment. So you get college credits. Um, uh, so, you know, it's, it really forces uh, kids and, and their support system at home um, to really be diligent on their schoolwork because there are no – Give me classes. Uh, you're going to have to take your electives online. Uh, that takes a lot of self-discipline. That's what college is. I mean, you know, at West Virginia, my, you know, Will took uh, there at the end. I mean, most of his classes were rural online, even though there are all these great buildings on campus. So you see more and more of that. I mean, um, Forward, it was the same way for him. He took about half his classes were, were online. So I, I think that, you know, um, our principal likes to say this isn't uh, college prep. It is college. And that's true. We've got kids that are graduating with 60 and 70, you know, credits that are paid for which is a very unique opportunity academically. Then athletically, um, we go find you know, coaches that are very passionate about coaching. And, um, you know, we don't have the science teachers getting a stipend and has to go out after grading papers and teaching all day to go out and say, oh, I got to go coach a practice. These guys are excited about coaching and developing kids and building programs. 
So I think so it, these it, coaches, they don't teach any classes at all. They just coach. Yeah, the model doesn't lend itself to that. I mean, so the way our, again, our school is a little unique in that you have a split schedule. You have two four-hour school days, basically. So you're an AM student. I just realized I have these in. I'm so sorry. <laughs> you're fine. You have, you have an AM schedule, a PM schedule. And if um, you're an AM uh, student, you practice in your sport in the afternoon and vice versa. But if you're a teacher, you're teaching the entire school day. So okay. as a result of that, you can't, you, know, you can't teach and coach at the same time. So um, it's, it's really that it's, <clears throat> on one hand, it's one of the biggest, I think, critical success factors of our athletic program. On the other hand, it's also probably our biggest challenge is finding qualified coaches and, because we don't, we don't have full-time jobs. And you think about most high school coaches, these are people that uh, have gone to school and got an education mm -hmm. uh, or, or certification so they can teach. And then they coach, you know, that enables them to, to coach. And in our case, you know, we're, we're trying to find people that have great flexibility in their schedule, uh, people that are retired, um, you know, just uh, so a lot of times we get really young guys that just are passionate about coaching and are willing to take whatever job they can find uh, to work coaching into it, or we get some retired guys. And sometimes we just get lucky and get, you know, kind of some in between. But our, our coaching staffs look, you know, different uh, because of that. Do you think that's a, a benefit to it have such a diverse coaching staff? If you can find, as long as we can find the coaches and keep them engaged, it's a huge benefit. But, I mean, like I said, it's just uh, our volleyball coach is a, was a Division One head coach at two different colleges. Um, our soccer coach is a um, – very renowned club coach, but you know, was a former Marine and was a pharmaceutical rep. So I mean, it's just, it's not your traditional, these aren't your guys that, um, and gals that are, you know, your typical came out of college to start teaching and started coaching. These are people that are, have developed, um, coaching skills over the years, uh, because they're passionate about it. And then we've been able to attract those, those guys because we provide an environment that's very conducive to athletic support. So our principal on deaf the, the charter of the school itself is pro athletics. We're not competing with, um, you know, other elements of the school for time or resource. It's, it's all about academics and then it's all about athletics. And that's really all we've got. What do you think is from your perspective as a coach, the greatest benefit to having such a strong emphasis on sports for a high school education? I'm just a big believer that sp team sports are the greatest teacher of life skills out there. I, I think if you've got, um, really qualified and focused teachers in the classroom, teaching the academics that uh, in the curriculum um, that's, you know, not just a test-based curriculum, but a curriculum for learning and mm -hmm. teaching and preparing for success in college. Um, I think that uh, that takes care of that piece. But I think team athletics, um, teamwork and hard work and discipline and commitment and dependability and dedication and all those, I mean, you go on and on, you know, the opportunities to be, to lead, opportunities to, have to, to speak and present in front of, peers and share ideas and you know deal Great with the, life skills yeah deal with the coach you love deal with the coach you don't love you know and everything in between I think those are the things that, that make people successful you know far beyond the playing field of the court can you explain a little bit about how charter school athletics work are you allowed to compete against like the traditional district schools we are a member of the, the in our case the South Carolina public school high school league so we have to follow all their rules for eligibility um, no different than anybody else so there's no, so a lot of, I will tell you this, you, in a charter school, the people that are about it are all in because they passionately believe in it and they're, they're excited to have their kids be a part of it and their families, you know, almost by definition, you get great support from those families because they've chosen an alternative education. Um, but just as, just as passionately, you're going to have people that want to see it fail and are going to throw rocks at it and mm -hmm. you know, whether it's intentional or otherwise, put out misinformation and um, and then people make opinions, formative opinions based on, hey, I'm from, this is where my, I went to school, or my dad went to school, or my granddad went to school, or my uncle, or you know, go down the list, and, you know, this is hurting, you know, we, we don't want the new upstart school to take away any of our shine, and, um, you know, you go have success, and, you know, just like in anything in life, when we have success, people won't tend to hate in our society, they're going to start throwing rocks at you, saying, hey, you must be doing something wrong, and um, I think that's the key for us is just being very transparent, open book. We follow the same rules as everybody else. Um, anybody's welcome here at any time to, to see how we do and, and, why, and what we do. And, uh, we're just very focused on, on having success with what we have. And the fact of it is we have some disadvantages. I think that's important to note is there's a perception we have a lot of advantage being what we are. We really don't. I mean, we follow the same eligibility rules. We don't have any county supplement money for facilities, so we, we, we lack facilities in a horrible woeful way um, we have to raise our own money for that 
Uh, we partnered with the, uh, our local town, which has been a tremendous partnership. So we, we did build a gym, and that, that serves uh, our sports. It, it can use that, obviously, but we also – it's used seven days a week by somebody in the community. Uh, the town we partner with kind of on a quid pro, pro quo basis to use their fields and that we don't have. And then um, they do everything from police training in the school building to you know, their, their rec programs being used, used able to use our gym at no cost. And then we rent it every every other hour of the day, it seems like, to a, you know, a club volleyball or a club um, basketball team, boys or girls. So you said that you have to raise money, um, like raise funds for some of things like sports fields and renting areas and, and all that. Do you – would you say that's similar to kind of like if you go to like a traditional public school and you're like selling candy or a bake sale for the band sort of a situation, or is this a much bigger fundraising kind of push to get donors? Yeah, there's two different pieces of that. There's a, a this capital campaign oriented for us to build our own facilities. You know, that, that's a big number. And we all, we have some land that you know, was bought when the school was, was uh, built, but it needs to be developed. And um, this development costs alone, much less putting, you know, making them play playing fields or adding exactly. other- <laughs> They're expensive. So that's a capital campaign that we have to go out and raise, you know, privately or corporately or both. Um, but what you hit on was something a little different. You know, the bake sale stuff. We we actually we charge a nominal athletic fee. Um, you know, like most schools do, I guess. But you know, participation fee basically. But it's not enough to cover what it takes to run a, a sports program. With we have 19 sports and 26 teams, so um, it, wow. it, it's nowhere close to covering that. We have you know we have. We'll have 700 students next year, which is max capacity, and we'll have 400-ish uh, athletes in the school and, so, and playing in some sport or team. Um, so what we've done is decentralized that. Instead of saying um, we don't have a traditional booster club or traditional athletic department fundraiser deal where it comes here and then we, we kind of dole it out and say, okay, well, if you know, softball gets a T-shirt and football gets a T-shirt and basketball gets one, but – you know, uh, lacrosse, you can't have two because everybody only gets one. We, we kind of decentralized that and said, hey, um, all right, boys soccer, if you want, you know, two T-shirts and travel sweats, or you know, then you can raise that money. And however, you know, we, we control a purchasing process to keep consistency and brand and, um, and logo and image, that kind of thing. But uh, you can have whatever you want. And what we found is that people are much more interested in supporting their own kids and network of kids uh, to support the things they want. We provide everything they need. We provide you know, whatever it costs to host a game, officials, you know, equipment, uniforms. We provide all that. But any, all the extras come from each individual team. So you, would you say there's a lot of community involvement then in that, in the sports? Tremendous. I mean, it, it, it takes a, to have a successful charter school, almost by definition, you have to have great community support. And I think that's what is, uh, we enjoy here is, you know, our parents are obviously very passionate about our school. But um, what we're founding is that, um, you have a lot of naysayers and a lot of negative energy and that almost, uh, you know, it, it almost um, pulls everybody else together to rally around. You know, why, why are you attacking these guys? You know, what, what are they doing wrong? And then when people pull back the covers and go, Hey man, these are good people and their kids are learning and they're doing, they're, they're killing it academically. And I mean, their sports success is unprecedented. Uh, and that, that's what usually raises the flags. If we were horrible in sports, nobody would care. But the fact <laughs> that we're having great success, everybody's, you know, they're either going, Hey, you're, you're cheating or doing something different wrong. You're hurting my school. Um, but when the reality of it is, I mean, there's a school that's got 4,000 kids across the street. That's just too many. It's the biggest school in the Carolinas. And, um, you know, our, our, our 700 kids aren't, you know, hurting their school. Um, you know, it's, uh, it's one of those things where um, the perception is, is, you know, the reality you learn to deal with. But I think what's, what's happened now is the community's kind of figured out that, you know, hey, you know, we, we, we're plenty big to support both. And, you know, this is just an alternative education. It's the same taxpayers live in our community. It's the same people shop at my store, or eat at my restaurant, or use my tire service or whatever it is. So why would we not support these guys? And I think, when the, again, with the typically our kids, just because of the structure, you have to be performing academically. You have to, you're involved with a sport or something typically. So you, you get, you typically got good kids and good families. I mean, you know, we're, we're like anybody else, it's not uh, it's not perfect. We're not perfect, but we have a good thing going here. Um, <laughs> you've mentioned some like misperceptions and naysayers. What kind of resistance have you all met when trying to integrate into the the public um, sport, high school sports in your state? I think legislatively, you know, there, there have been some challenges because again, it's um, there's a perception. You know, for better or for worse, there's kind of an old boy network with, um, 
the politics of being the high school league. And, and I think that's not germane to South Carolina. I think that could be anywhere. Um, but, you know, we, we frankly we went through the process to, to apply for membership. We're accepted. We have to follow those rules. I think that the real resistance comes when uh, other schools, more traditional schools, that start going, um, you know, they want to know. Um, uh, I'm sorry. I, hey, y'all, can you just a little bit, man? I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I know you were recording. You're fine. So I lost what I was talking about. Um, I forgot the question. Oh, you're fine. I was asking what kind of resistance you all have faced, if any, integrating into like the traditional high school sports kind of community. Yeah, so it's not so much in the state, as uh, was my point. I'm sorry. It was. It's more that um, the team, the schools that, that feel threatened, uh, especially in your immediate area, they, they're going to make it hard to schedule. Uh, they, they're not going to play you. They're going to try to blackball you. They're going to tell people not to play you. Um, they're going to throw rocks. And, and people maybe – don't feel threatened, but don't know anybody. They, they've never done any research because they don't really need to care, so mm -hmm. to speak. Uh, they just assume that, well, that's what the you know the, the traditional school down the road's been there forever says, and it must be true. So they must be doing something wrong. So it creates this negative perception that you're always having to kind of fight uphill from. So the only way to defend that is just do things the right way and be very transparent in, in how you operate. Um, what is your response? Um, to concerns from public schools about a charter school's ability to quote unquote like poach the best student athletes. I mean, yeah, some of it, you know, like I'm not going to say that, that hasn't happened probably in some places. I think, you know, all stereotypes typically are grounded in, in something or some kernel of it. Um, I could just speak from our experience here. I mean, our, our school's full. And so one of the problems that, that charter schools have is that once you get to capacity, you go to a waiting list. So I could have a, you know, I coach football. I could have a five-star defensive tackle move down here from Morgantown, move right next door to school, and I can't guarantee that he would play for me. He, he, family wants to go here. This is the school they choose. They want to be here. But if I'm full and they don't get in, he doesn't get in. He has to go to the, other, the traditional public school in our area who, who can't deny anybody. We can't deny anybody or be selective in admissions. So, you know, whoever applies, you know, you can get in. It's a public school. But we have a, a negative – we have a choke on the back end that doesn't allow us to, to be selective. So you know, if we have a enrollment capacity issue, it's first come, first serve. Okay. So you, you can't select students. You can't be like, oh, well, we want that student, but not that student. Okay. Yeah. But you do so, have a capacity for, like, how many students can safely be in the building. <laughs> right. That's right. So whatever the – I mean, the, our, our charter is for 700 kids. That's the, so that's it. Okay. We won't have 700, you know, one. I mean, we won't. I mean, so whatever it is, or whatever your charter is, what it is for. And so, look, as a school, it's, it's, you run these schools like a business. And that's one of the things that makes them successful is you, know, you only spend what you have. You don't spend more than what you budget for. And you better you take the money you have allocated and spend it wisely. Um, you have to be creative in that regard. There's a couple other issues with that. But in terms of, you know, students, I mean, right, this is what it's going to be. So if I've got a charter for 700. I've only got. You know, what's my break-even point? Is it 500? So everything after 500 now, we're starting to you know, put money to the good where we can do you know, creative and, and fun things in the school. So there's, you know, there's, the charter schools are, are driven and motivated to track families and to get kids here. But once they're, you know, once your capacity, you know, I mean, if you've got a good thing going and buzzes out there, if you want to be a part of it, well, then you're kind of hamstrung because you can only do what you can do. I mean, this is it. This notion of going and poaching the kids and bringing the kids you know, it's it's a, it's a myth. But if you're, and the, the the truth of it is, and nobody likes to talk about this, because um, I coach in private school, I've coached in public school, um, I've got great friends that coach in in all three environments. Um, I would say that most people, if you got them honestly, and got them behind closed doors, say I don't I don't be on record saying this. The biggest offenders, the biggest recruiters out there are traditional public schools. Those guys, I mean, it's about poaching and recruiting. I mean, that's that's really where that happens more than anywhere because everybody else is under such scrutiny that you can't, you're not supposed to do what you can do. You're soon to do it, so you're always trying to, you know, I got to check these boxes. And in the meanwhile, use the ones that are screaming loudest about recruiting the ones out recruiting the hardest. I mean, that's that's my experience. So I don't know. I, I'm not a – I don't put a lot in that. I just think that uh, families do what they think is going to be best for their kids, plain and simple. So I have a kid that plays for me here – or a traditional public school or a private school, and they choose to go somewhere else, they're doing what they think is best for that kid. And I'll never begrudge that. I don't, you know, I'm not going to um, belittle the kid or shame him or, or make him feel uncomfortable. I mean, it's and truly, it's on me it's from an athletic perspective to provide an environment that he wants to be a part of. And he wants to, you know, I got to be able to keep the guys I've got. And yeah. the, the kids in our school need to want to play ball in our school. 
If you want to play somewhere else, and we're not doing something right. <laughs> so if you're recruitable, I guess that's always my thing. I mean, the being recruited, what, what do we get? We're not paying anybody. I mean, so we're these people would say, okay, we're recruiting from the big five A school or wherever I man that's what's around us. Why would you leave the big five A school with all the facilities, all the mm -hmm. kids? marching band, the cheerleaders, all the great things to come to our little tiny school to have a field. I mean, what am I recruiting you with? I mean, tuition's free already. I mean, it's not big cost to go here. I mean, what, what's the recruiting? That's, that's the thing that always gets me is, you, you, what are we recruiting to? You know, if it's opposite, I, I could see maybe, but, you know, I, I think that parents and kids want to be a part of things that they believe in. And if we, we as an athletic department, as a school, build classroom environments that are safe and uh, family oriented and um, high achieving oriented uh, and in same uh, same thing the same thing with athletics if we're building we're having coaches that are building teams and, and, and programs more importantly that uh, are doing positive things for kids and having success and people going to be a part of it. and so come on love to have you you've mentioned a lot about like the community orientation at the charter school where you are and you've talked about kind of the way you all do the fundraising and you've also mentioned that you've worked in both pub traditional public and charter schools. Um, when yep. thinking about your experience in both traditional public and charter schools, um, how would you describe like the difference or maybe similarity in parental involvement in sports? Well, I think that's that's one. Uh, I think it really depends on where you are. I, that's not a, one you can, I think, answer across the board. I mean, I've, I've been in and I've seen. Um, demographics for the socioeconomics are lower, but mm -hmm. they've had great parent involvement and there's great community support. I mean, those communities are just, I mean, a neighborhood school or community school, they just, you know, go on on to and, and you know, make it a great place. And I've seen by the same token, you know, economically depressed areas where they just, you know, the economy's bad. There's not a lot of money, parents, you know, maybe a lot of broken homes. And so they get, it's the opposite. So I don't think it, you know, and same thing for, you know, affluent areas. I mean, you can, you know, Logically, you would say, well, it's easier to have support from affluent areas. That's probably true uh, across the board, but, you know, I've seen both. Um, I just think that uh, it really comes down to, you know, leadership. I mean, if you've got um, a school system, in our case, a, a principal and a, and a board that are just, hey, we're committed to this and we're going to do things the right way, make it a great place, then you, you, know, you find ways to do it. And there's examples after example, I mean, inner city Atlanta. I've got a great friend that coached uh, down there and went to a traditional public school that had nothing. But he created so much positive energy and got kids off the streets doing things in a positive way and attracted corporate money and was able to do things for those kids that had never been done before um, against all odds kind of thing. And then, you know, you get in affluent places sometimes and people have lots of choices. And so, you know, kind of the opposite happens. Well, it's just supports to do other things. So I think it's really it doesn't matter where you are or you know what your socioeconomic demographics are it really matters. The leadership and the culture. I mean, I'm, I'm just a big believer, whether it's business or uh, sports. Um, building a school. Uh, it's all about the culture you create. And that starts with leadership and a vision, passion, and communicating, articulating a cultural vision that people buy into. And then, uh, just like with football, we have a culture that, that we create as coaches. When the kids take ownership of it, that's when the magic happens. And um, I, we just, we've always said we believe that, you know, winning kids is our goal. If we win enough kids, winning games will take care of itself. And, and it has. And I think that's the same thing's kind of happening in our school right now, and I think it can happen in communities when you know, the culture is set down by somebody that's, that's passionate about it and believes in it and then becomes contagious and the constituent base takes ownership of that culture. That's when really great stuff happens. That's awesome. Well, I just have one last question for you before we wrap it up. Um, what is one thing that you would like West Virginians to know about charter school athletics? Um, they're going to be what you make of them. If you support it and embrace it, uh, it can be a, a great thing. Um, you know, there's um, if you're gonna throw rocks at it and um, you know and, and try to tear it down, it's gonna be a, an uphill battle for those people who are trying to do something good for their kids and their families. I think at the end of the day, remember it's high school sports. You know, it's it's these are kids, and the more kids are playing ball, the better, right? I mean, instead mm -hmm. of having one school they can play at, now they got two. And the reality of it is in most places, uh, you know, the charter schools aren't nearly as good as traditional schools. In most places, you know, the leftovers is what they, that would be, I first got here, they, the one student section was calling us the the name of the school nearby, Rejects. You know, that's, that's how their student fan, the fan base was cheering against our kids. I thought it was hilarious. Now that we're winning, nobody says that anymore, you know, but it's, but the reality of it is, if people remember that these are kids and their families and they're just playing ball, 
support them. I mean, why would you not? I mean, if you have, you know, 20 kids playing on a, you know, a softball team and I can get 20 more playing on another one, now you got 40 kids playing. That's a good thing, right? I mean, yeah. Just more opportunities for kids to learn, be educated, and have an opportunity to play sports. I think that's a good thing for everyone. Have those life experiences. That's exactly right. They saw if it, you make it about you or those people that are just trying to be, um, this has got to be about my school or this school and, and nothing else. Nothing can take away from it. You can't take my shine off. Or you, you know, <laughs> you're going to hurt hurt me somehow by being successful. You're, you're focused on the wrong things. Well, thank you so much for joining me today and for taking the time to do this interview. Um, it's been really great to talk to you, Coach Greer, and I hope you have a wonderful day in South Carolina. You got it. Thanks a lot. Have a great thank day. Thank you. Bye-bye.